Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Gary Skolnick. I'm the CEO and founder of Neighborhood Sun. And uh, I am uh, very excited to have this uh, webinar tonight to tell you about Neighborhood Sun and tell you about why I'm so pumped about our future and, and about the future of community solar. A little bit about myself. Uh, you might notice that that young guy with a beard on the screen. I have been doing uh, clean energy and climate advocacy and uh, entrepreneurship for over 20 years. And I have the video proof of it. So that's a, a picture of me uh, with the work. We are all Smith Islanders video put out by Mike Tidwell, Mark Cohen with the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Back then I was advocating for Maryland to adapt, adopt a seven and a half percent renewable standard, believe it or not. It was very little. It took three hard years, but we got the bill passed in 2004. And um, that really started the clean energy industry in Maryland. Before that, we had about half a dozen people working in clean energy. Now the state boasts several thousand people working on clean, clean energy. And over all these 22 years that I've been working in the industry, and trying to advocate for solutions to climate change, um, I never saw something as exciting as community solar. And so after uh, 2015, when Maryland passed our community solar legislation, I was extremely excited to start a business in that space. And so I founded Neighborhood Sun because I believe that the clean energy transition needs to be equitable, needs to happen quickly and at scale, and also needs to build stronger community. <laughs> and with Neighborhood Sun in the community solar space, we have found a way, the only way to create an equitable clean energy future for everybody quickly and at scale in a way that really supports local communities and doesn't work against them. The renewable transition is happening. There's no doubt about it, whether it's uh, because of climate change and all the various impacts that we're already seeing uh, from climate change, or whether it's um, the, uh, the increase in the renewable energy industry and how it's actually the prices have been lowering and um, how it's basically unstoppable or from all the electric vehicles that people are buying and even the fact that uh, um, the internal combustion engine is on its way out and our grandchildren will only know about internal combustion engines by reading about them in the history books. So this transition is happening whether people want it or not. But the question is, is it going to happen in a way that, that works for everybody? The first question about that is, will it be equitable? Um, will it benefit everybody in a fair way? Uh, and looking at the history of our energy industry, the past practices, things don't look so good. Um, we, we know that in states like, uh, well, in all states across the country, that the siting of coal-fired power plants often happened outside of vulnerable communities uh, and communities of, of color. You would just look at a map of Baltimore and you can see a, a literal ring of coal-fired power plants surrounding the city. Uh, I've also had the, uh, the honor of traveling with Greenpeace back in the early 2000s to Cancer Alley. Uh, between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, where you see power plant after power plant, chemical plants, all situated near predominantly African-American communities that are literally poisoning the communities in places where they live. We also know that, that on-site solar uh, has not really been available for everybody. It's generally for wealthier people. Uh, it's certainly only for people who live in houses. It has to be the right kind of house with the right kind of roof. So that hasn't actually worked either. It has not been equitable. And finally, um, even clean energy companies themselves have engaged in unethical sales practices where they targeted 
uh, uh, vulnerable communities in basically scams, uh, sign people up for energy products that didn't save them money, that ended up costing them dearly and um, uh, really broke a lot of promises and burned those communities quite a bit. The next question is, will the energy transition happen quickly enough? Well, uh, residential photovoltaics are projected to grow annually by about 6%. But at these rates, renewables would only provide about 17% of US energy consumption compared to 12.5% today. And even looking at that 12.5% today, a big piece of that is hydro, which uh, some of that is okay, uh, but some of that does have issues and biomass as well, which has some emissions as, uh, issues associated with it. Um, so under the current system, we are not getting there quickly enough. Finally, will it build stronger communities? And uh, based on our past experience, we see that that, that hasn't happened. Um, and it hasn't empowered people to choose the benefits of clean energy in their own community. That was one of the things that really uh, I love about community solar is that it allows everybody to access the benefits of solar power. Anyone who pays an electric bill can access community solar. And even better, you're accessing solar that is right in your neighborhood. You're not buying wind from Texas or uh, clean energy certificates from some other part of the country. You're buying solar power from just down the road from where you live. And that is truly a game changer. Well, so I found the Neighborhood Sun back in 2016, 2016, and we got, we really got going in about 2018. And I'm ex very proud of the kind of company we have been building. Uh, we are a B Corporation with the highest rating of uh, B Corp impact score of any solar company in the, in the country with 130.5. We've also been honored with the best for the world in the environment category for two years running. Uh, we really try to live and breathe our mission. We are a for-profit company, but we are a company that, um, but we are a company that also is impacting the planet, the communities we serve, our employees, and all the stakeholders, not just the shareholders. Uh, we have a manifesto, uh, which I encourage everyone to, to read when you're on our website. And I'll just highlight a couple of them. One is that businesses can be a force for good. And this is an experience I had over the many years of advocating for positive environmental legislation, whether in Annapolis or DC or elsewhere, uh, seeing that most business groups would often oppose us on any kind of legislation we tried. And I realized that, that that can't be the case, that there's gotta be some good businesses out there. Well, best way to do it is to lead by example. So I founded a, a, a clean energy business and um, I firmly believe that we can show others how businesses can act and we could be a positive force. Uh, I also believe that the answer isn't more consumers, it's more community. Uh, we don't wanna just create more things for people to buy. We want to create stronger communities where people uh, have the ability to resist against um, encroachments and also have the ability to advocate for themselves for clean energy and for other issues as well. Another one I'll just point out one more is clean energy is for everyone. Uh, I spent too many years having to sell clean energy to just a few, to very few people who could actually afford it. And now with Neighborhood Sun, we are very happy to supply clean energy to anybody who um, pays an electric bill. And we specifically work with low and moderate income communities where we operate. So when you support Neighborhood Sun, you are supporting a company that is the most dynamic company in the community solar space. You are pushing 
and you're helping us to push for an equitable clean energy future. Uh, you're helping us to advance community solar quickly and at scale across the country. And you're helping us to build stronger communities. So with your support, we can make the change we need to do rapidly in order to not just fight climate change, but to help communities that need it and to put money back in people's pockets instead of having them pay it out to the utilities who don't need that extra money. All right, I will wrap that up. That's the first part of our presentation. The second part is uh, I will be sharing a deck as we will go further into uh, talking about Neighborhood Sun, our success and our looking at our future. Uh, while I am pulling this up, I wanna just remind people that uh, this is being recorded and we're happy to share the recording with anybody. Uh, uh, we will be sharing it with everyone after this. And also uh, that we will not be talking about specifics of any kind of investments in, um, in Neighborhood Sun on this call. Uh, all the details on the investment are at our WeFunder page, which I will sh share the link um, later on. Actually, Emily, why don't you put in the chat, go ahead and put in the chat uh, uh, the, the uh, link to our WeFunder page, so people have that as well. Yeah, hold it. Thank you. Uh, so 80% of Americans are left behind by the rooftop solar market. Um, if you don't own a house, if your roof is shaded, if you have an old roof, uh, if you have a small business, uh, there are a million reasons why you cannot get rooftop solar. And the utilities are not pushing this hard enough. And um, uh, it's a real problem. This is a serious problem if we're going to get to solar at scale. However, um, community solar is a way to reach everybody. And Neighborhood Sun um, plays a significant role in the community solar market. The current market is $1 billion in the states with existing programs. This does not even count uh, uh, states that are coming online or uh, whether these existing programs will be expanded or not. So if we just look at where we are today, it's a billion dollar market. And if we are able to capture 5% of the market, that puts us at a $50 million level. Uh, we currently, um, uh, are on a path to getting to 5%. Uh, we are not there yet, but uh, that is our goal. And a community solar or VNM, and VNM stands for virtual net metering. And the reason why I put that in there is because you also could have uh, community small hydro. Um, we are actually working on some small hydro projects in New York. And virtual net metering is the same tool that uh, goes for either solar or community hydro. All it means is that um, you are subscribing to a, a solar project. You're not directly connecting to it by any wires or anything like that. Uh, and the power that the project produces is put on the grid and the utility um, puts your share of the power that it's produced onto your electric bill, but it's all done virtually. And it's very similar to net metering, which is how uh, you get credit for solar that you put on your roof. But it's the same exact thing, except just done virtually. So as more states enact community solar rules, the, the, the growth could be dramatic. And even looking at the, um, at the, sort of moderate case scenario, we see 84 gigawatts of potential growth through the year 2030. And it's no surprise why, because community solar is the only solar that is applicable to everybody. So it's got a lot of political uh, winds behind it because it addresses environmental equity, energy equity, as well as 
clean energy, climate change, air pollution, things of that sort. Uh, Neighborhood Sun has had a track record of success in community solar so far. Uh, starting on the left-hand side here, we have acquired over 12,000 customers to date. And our customer acquisition cost is less than half of the industry average. It's about $245 per customer for us. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you can see the, the increase we've had um, in our past, uh, in 2021, in customer management. So we started out in January of last year with 12.8 megawatts of uh, projects that we were managing. And by the end of the year, we were up to 80 megawatts. Uh, so that's a 550% increase. And we are on pace to do uh, 300 megawatts by the end of next year. So going from 12.8 in January of 2021, to 300 megawatts by the end of 2023 um, is significant growth for us. We also dramatically increased the total value of our booked contracts from around the $1 million to over $21, $28 million in a year. Our recurring revenue from customer management uh, jumped 343%, and our customer count has gone up 3x to over 12,000, as I said. We also have a very strong pipeline of future projects worth over $75 million as more and more solar developers realize that working with Neighborhood Sun is the best option for them in the community solar space. So how exactly do we make money? Well, we are the missing link between the solar asset owner and the consumer. So on the one hand, you've got uh, the solar asset owner, the companies that, that buy the solar projects or the developers who build the solar projects, they do not have any experience in the mass market. So they, uh, they don't have a way of reaching out to the mass market. Neighborhood Sun provides an advanced software platform we call Sun Engine that allows the uh, mass market customers, residents or small businesses to enroll with community solar projects in their area. We then um, manage those customers for the lifetime of the project. We currently have 11 solar partners we're working with that have 76 projects under our management and we will continue adding more each year. And the reason why we're gonna continue adding more is because the community solar asset owners uh, love our Sun Engine software platform. This is something that, that is, is pretty amazing. When we started out in 2018, there were a few solar uh, community solar platforms out there, but they were built kind of very quickly and not specifically for the community solar industry. It took us a couple of years and we had to use a few platforms before, before we realized there's just nothing out there that works. So we built our own platform called Sun Engine. We were very fortunate to be able to uh, bring on one of the founders of Bullfrog Power, which is uh, Canada's leading green energy company, uh, as our CTO, John Wilson. And John brought a team from Bullfrog and they spent a year building our Sun Engine platform from the ground up and with the advantage of knowing what works and what doesn't work in the market. Well, the first thing we knew that didn't work is that these platforms that are out there are very rigid and we needed a platform that was flexible and fully customizable. And in order to do that, you have to build, that, build it that way from the ground up. So that was a, kind of a lucky advantage for us. Uh, so our platform is fully customizable. It allows white labeling and integrates with service offerings like customer acquisition. It also integrates with any kind of utility um, and any kind of state market that we are in. Another thing we knew is that it had to be custom built for community solar. Uh, it couldn't be an adapted platform. Uh, additionally, it had to be completely transparent. We heard from the, the solar asset owners that they were not very happy with the other platforms because they didn't have a good view on 
the customers, the contracts, the revenue they, that they can expect, the, the pr production and performance. So we built ours completely transparent. Um, it's also a full featured and very lightweight platform. Uh, so it, it's very easy to build on new features and to make changes. And we do that all the time now. We have a very good process where our salespeople and our marketing people are able to give direct feedback to our technology team, which integrates that feedback into the platform practically in real time. Because of the Sun Engine platform, we were able to secure two large portfolio contracts. And this was after these asset owners did extensive due diligence in the market. They looked around everywhere. They looked at our competition. They looked at us. Um, and they decided that our platform and our team were the best ones. So they switched from our competition actually to us. And um, that's the kind of proof in the pudding you need to show that the Sun Engine is actually our competitive advantage. So uh, looking at the unit economics here, the average customer lifetime value for the customer acquisition and the management that we do is $1,100. The cost to acquire the customer is about, as I said earlier, $245. So there you can see the margin that we make over time on these customers. And because of this, we are expecting significant revenue growth over the next few years. We did one and a half million dollars in revenue last year. Uh, we are projecting about $3 million in revenue this year, and then seven and a half next year, and in 2024, $15 million in revenue. So our technology plus our powerful green brand gives us a leg up on the competition. And look at our impact on the community to date. And for those of you who have already invested in us, you can take pride in knowing that this was partially due to your investments. And for those who are yet to invest in us, uh, this is where your money goes. Uh, we have helped over 1,000 low and moderate income residents to gain access to solar energy. The average annual savings for an LMI household is $108. Again, that's money that they're not taking out of their wallet and giving to the utility, but they're keeping it for their family's budget and for their own needs. Uh, in aggregate, we have saved over $108,000 for low and moderate income residents. Uh, that's definitely something we can all be proud of. Our impact on the environment is pretty clear. I mean, the more solar we deploy, the more community solar we deploy, the less greenhouse gases are emitted and uh, the less coal fossil fuels need to be burned. Uh, we've got a, a great executive team with many years of experience. Uh, myself, as I talked about, uh, Tom Smith is our chief revenue officer. Tom was the president and co-founder of Astral Power and before that, he was um, head of residential sales at Direct Energy Solar and Astral. So he's led national teams uh, in doing sales. Astral Power, I should mention, was the, one of the leading sales organizations in community solar in the state of New York. We acquired them last year, uh, closed the deal in November. And that gave us access to a, a very large pipeline in New York. And um, it also gave us people like Tom who uh, bring a lot of great experience. And with that pipeline in New York, that's part of the $75 million pipeline that we have. John Wilson, our chief technology pipeline officer. might be the wrong word. Yeah, true. Uh, John Wilson, the chief technology officer I already mentioned. Uh, our leadership team is a mix of folks from, some from Astral and then uh, some were uh, right here in Neighborhood Sun. Uh, Cara Humphrey is our VP of Strategic Sales. Emily Tokarowski, who, has, who is the first official employee at Neighborhood Sun, uh, is our VP of Marketing. Armando Gaitaniello is our VP of Business Development in the Mid-Atlantic. 
Um, and Aaron Fagan is our uh, director of sales in the Mid-Atlantic. And then Yasi Chang, our VP of finance and operations. Uh, Jenny Ravi is our senior management of customer care. Some of you where customers might have interacted with her. And Dave and Fred came over also from Astral. Dave does business develop, development in the Northeast and Fred does sales in the Northeast. And the difference between business development and sales is the business development guys are going to the, they're, they're doing B2B work. So they are going to the uh, community solar asset owners and developers and getting them to contract with Neighborhood Sun to have us do the acquisition and management on our Sun Engine platform. And then the sales like Fred and Aaron, they actually then are the ones who are going out to the communities to sign people up for community solar projects. Our board of directors is very strong. Uh, we have Bill Bumpers is our chair. He was uh, the head of the climate and energy practice at Baker Botts. Uh, and then Wilson Chang uh, is a successful solar entrepreneur who was the, the uh, largest shareholder in Astral. Uh, Sherry Friedman is a climate and sustainability leader who's an independent board member. Uh, part of our governance structure is having two seats available for independent board members. Um, Kim Colt is an impact and sustainability investor. Uh, and Ian Sneed is the COO of Galt Power, one of our strategic investors. Uh, Satish Tamboli and, and John Paul Mascarella are board observers. And Satish is with MTech, which is a combination of the University of Maryland and the Department of Natural Resources. And they invest in Maryland companies that are helping to fight climate change and clean up the Chesapeake Bay. And we're honored that they have chosen to invest in Neighborhood Sun in two consecutive rounds. Uh, the use of funds um, that we are raising uh, is to invest more in our Sun Engine innovation, since that is one of our competitive advantages. We want to double down on that and uh, continue to innovate and be ahead of the market. We want to expand to new markets, and we also want to make key executive hires to round out the rest of our management team. Um, here's our contact information, and again, we will share this, but uh, you can email me uh, at gary.skolnick at neighborhoodsun.solar, uh, or you can call me, and, um, and then for those who were interested, uh, we are uh, in the midst of a community round, uh, which is another way to raise money outside of the traditional VC round. I like to say it's it's a uh, it's a well I, I I can't take credit for it but it's democratizing investment uh, giving everybody the opportunity to participate in Neighborhood Sun while we are still a private company so you can find out uh, more about our uh, about the raise at wefunder.com forward slash Neighborhood Sun. There's all the details of exactly what the investment is um, and um, uh, more details about the company uh, and the Form C that we file with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which will tell you uh, in great detail about the company and also talk about some of the risks associated with this. Of course, any investment in, a, um, in an early stage company comes with significant risk. Uh, but we are raising money right now, and the reason why uh, we, we are raising money to continue our growth. Uh, we've had a lot of success. We were able to raise money on WeFunder last year, and that helped us to do all the wonderful things that I just talked about earlier. Uh, if you invest in the next 48 hours, we have a special little perk because we know people are busy and, and you might be excited, but then you forget uh, life gets in the way. Uh, invest in the next 48 hours and you'll receive a $50 Tis Best gift card, which is usable at thousands of charities across the country, whether it's environmental or charities that are supporting reproductive choice and health. Um, 
anything that you are interested in supporting, they, I'm pretty sure they have it. With that, um, I'm happy to open it up to questions. And I'll ask, this is Emily here, if you folks could add into the chat, that would be awesome. Um, I'll help moderate and kind of make sure everybody uh, gets their questions answered. I have a question. Um, this is Charlie Behrens in Orlando, Florida. Hey, Charlie. So uh, we're up against uh, Florida Power and Light owned by a next energy and uh, they won't let us use virtual net metering. Got any suggestions on how we can uh, address that? You've been through this, <laughs> you've got 20 years fighting it. And uh, oh, by the way, I am an investor, um, but uh, we, we need to open up Florida yes. so that uh, community solar can come on in. I agree 100%. Uh, we're part of a national trade group, the um, Coalition for Community Solar, uh, uh, that is working in almost every state in the country to try to uh, advance legislation. Florida is, is a tough one. I mean, I remember going there 20 years ago trying to promote solar. As the Sunshine State, it should be the leader. And FPL is doing a lot of solar development, but they're doing it in a way that, in my opinion, doesn't benefit the consumers or the ratepayers. Right. Uh, so I, I, uh, I don't have, <laughs> I wish I had a secret formula for how to get this done, but I could tell you that the, um, that community solar should uh, uh, attract a wider audience and, as part of any, um, any movement, uh, we once heard this, I remember from Senator Chris Van Hollen, well before he was a US Senator, is just get the widest possible coalition you can and keep hammering away. So, you know, people working on social justice, people working on uh, uh, urban issues, people working on, um, on obviously environmental issues, and, uh, and then even conservatives uh, who maybe um, are interested in economic development or things, uh, faith leaders, is just getting a very wide coalition. Great, thank you, Gary. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, Matthew has his hand raised. Uh, yeah, so go okay. ahead. Yes, greetings. My name is Matthew LaFleur. I live in a rural town, a state called Al Alberg, Vermont, which, you know, solar industry in Vermont is very, very, as itself, tough as it is. Uh, how can you, <clears throat> on accessibility part, make it more uh, easy for rural communities around the country to have new markets to promote more solar industries to basically help out, like you said, the low income, moderate families, the BIPOC communities, these marginalized communities that want to do what's right for their communities and to participate and to play a significant role for the economics within, within the rural America spectrum. It ain't just big downtowns, it's also the rural areas are forgetting that it needs to be balanced because the energy sector itself in the Northeast King, Northeast New England states, you know, like Florida, like you said, but that's Southern, uh, it's, you know, how can we expand on the rural area markets around the United States of America? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, this is just my opinion. I would say that the best, the best direction we can go in is to first demonstrate incredible success in the markets where community solar is happening already. So in states like New York, where it is um, statewide, there's many rural communities. And, and in fact, uh, you know, the big city in, in New York, of course, is New York City. Uh, but New York City uh, 
it's very difficult to build large solar fields there. So uh, most of the solar development, community solar in New York is happening upstate in more of the rural areas and it's, it's succeeding. But uh, we need to take those kind of case studies and show the, the success of reaching uh, the variety of communities that you mentioned, and then take that to other states. In my experience as, a, as an advocate, um, nothing is better than being able to go to a state legislator and say, hey, look, in this state, they're already doing this and it's working and here are the results, A, B, and C. And if we adopt this in our state, we can also uh, succeed. Uh, so we did that with the renewable portfolio standard, which was a requirement that a certain amount of electricity has to come from clean sources. Uh, when I started out 22 years ago, there were uh, you know, maybe a dozen states that had that standard. Now it's, once we show that it succeeded in several states, it's now widespread across the country. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so I have another question here in the chat for you, Gary. Um, what is the primary means to acquire retail customers? So for us, uh, we it all starts with our brand. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to having a very credible and authentic brand to walk the walk. And uh, that includes amazing customer service. So if we have a strong brand and we're keeping our customers very happy, then we can do a few things. One is we can partner with nonprofits, uh, faith organizations, environmental, social, social justice, civic organizations to spread the word about Neighborhood Sun and get people to sign up. And we've done that very successfully with dozens of uh, partners and we've contributed tens of thousands of dollars to those partners. Uh, so that's one way. The second way is then through referrals. We uh, like to work a lot with our existing customers. And if they're happy to refer to others and we have a little referral program where everybody gets benefits. Uh, the other ways we do this is through your more traditional sales and marketing. We do have a sales team. Uh, we also do digital uh, marketing as well. We try to have everything working in conjunction um, uh, so that we have our marketing and our sales and our partnerships and our referrals all happening together and supporting each other. Great. Uh, one of the next questions is uh, someone who's an existing investor. Thank you, Jerome. Um, what is your runway status and any idea of a timetable for going public? Uh, well, we... Um... We expect to do, as I said, about three million. I'm sorry, in revenue this year, and um, uh, we've got we've got plenty of runway uh, to keep us going. Uh, we expect to expand to 300 megawatts by the end of next year. Um, I don't know about a time. I wouldn't say a timeline to going public, but as we think about how would we exit, uh, one of the uh, interesting things we are thinking about is a regulation A plus, which is like a mini IPO. Uh, that's kind of a next step after a WeFunder uh, uh, community round. And the mini IPO uh, uh, can raise up to 50 or $100 million. So it's, it's not so mini, but it's not a full IPO and you don't have to go through the investment banker and all of that. Uh, we also, it's possible we could be acquired uh, there's uh, some larger players in the space um, and or we could do a full IPO. I mean, I expect uh, this is a for anyone who's considering investment. This is a long term partnership between you and us to spread the word and build community solar and build a successful business. It's going to be several years. Great. Um, and I see someone has their hand raised. I'll kind of go between the, the chats and the hand raises. So um, one more in the sure. chat. Um, who are your key competitors? Uh, great question. So the biggest competitor out there is Arcadia Power. They are valued at one and a half billion dollars. So they have a lot more resources than we do, but they are not exclusively in community solar. They are building a... Um, 
a data mining software platform that wants to go out after the entire utility industry, uh, which is pretty exciting, but that's, that's a different game. Uh, they're, but they, they're kind of the big dogs out there. Uh, there's a few other competitors, uh, Ampien, uh, uh, Power Market, uh, and um, Perch, to name a few. Uh, really, most of us are all around the same size, and we each have our own kind of geographic strength. Our main strength is Maryland, uh, but we are in multiple markets. And then we also, as I said, uh, our software platform compares very favorably with anybody else who's out there. Great. Um, all right. One more in the chat, and then I'll go to the hands. Um, so. Do you have to use an investment broker or an advisor to um, invest in Neighborhood Sun on WeFunder? And how many shares are included in just the base level 250? Okay, I can answer the first one. No, you do not have to use a broker or investment advisor. That's the whole point of these community rounds on platforms like WeFunder. It's meant to be a more democratic process where you can directly invest in any company that you want to, that is on the platform. Uh, this is part of the Jobs Act that was passed under President Obama um, as a way to spur investment in startups and rising companies that are not yet on the public market. Uh, I can't answer the second question because that is about a term of the investment and uh, I'm not allowed to answer that. If you don't see the answer to that on the WeFunder website, feel free to email or call me or text me. I'd be happy to answer. Hello, sir. Uh, great, all right. Um, Edward, I believe you have your hand raised. If you wanna go ahead and ask your question, that'd be awesome. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, I understand that where your business stands from consumer to producer. Um, at this moment, I'm not interested in being an investor as maybe some of the other people on this call are, uh, but I am interested in buying solar energy rather than uh, what I'm buying at the moment. And I'd like to know how I can uh, hopefully through you find some people in the Baltimore area that can pri provide me with solar energy as opposed to what I'm buying right now. Well, Edward, you're in luck. You can just go to our website, neighborhoodsun.solar. Uh, we do have projects that serve the Baltimore area and the BGE utility territory. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. That segues nicely to another question. Um, are you looking for customers or just investors at this time? Uh, right now, well, we're always looking for customers, but uh, the focus of this webinar is, uh, and, and the focus of the WeFunder page is on investment. Uh, so we're, we uh, have raised several hundred thousand already. We have over 1,700 investors uh, in total through both of our WeFunder campaigns, and that's the focus that we're on right now. Um, and then solar projects are experiencing some issues or slowdowns connecting to the grid. Are we involved in this in any way or how are our developers and what's our experience? Uh, so Neighborhood Sun does not do the, the interconnection or the construction of the projects. Uh, so this is, the, this is the developers that we work with. Uh, we have seen some slowdowns on connecting to the grid in specific markets. It's, it's really market by market, um, but overall uh, things are moving forward rapidly. Um, so we haven't seen you know, enough of an issue to be concerned about. Got it. Um, and this one's related to like kind of the site selection. Um, are we, or maybe our developers that we work with approaching small farmers uh, with a lease agreement to put a community solar project on their property? Um, and then like in that case, the farmer gets a win-win kind of situation with money from the lease. Uh, yes, uh, Neighborhood Sun does not, uh, we do not do the site selection ourselves. We work with the developers who already have 
selected sites. They haven't built the projects yet, but they have built it. And typically it is a win-win for everybody, whether it's a farmer or uh, a building owner or uh, a landfill owner. Uh, whatever the property is, the solar farm pays a lease that is an annual lease for 20, 25 years. So it works very well for small farmers, uh, but I want to emphasize that that's not the only site that is available. We have a project in Montgomery County, Maryland uh, called the Oaks Landfill Project, and it's, it's sited on, you guessed it, a landfill. And that project uh, is the largest 100% LMI project in the entire country. Uh, so very exciting to work on that, but it's not, it's not on a farm, it's on a landfill. Uh, we also work on projects that are actually cited on warehouses. Uh, and you know that works as well. I'm sure somebody's gonna ask what about parking lots? Uh, we haven't worked on any of those yet. Uh, the issue with parking canopies is in many, most places they're just too expensive. Uh, because you have to build the additional um, infrastructure besides the solar panels. So uh, we haven't seen any that, that have worked, but we would love to work on projects on parking lots. And we'd also love to see more financial incentives to encourage developers to build on parking lots. Yeah, and one of the, the pieces to speak to that, I see there's another question here about um, someone concerned about some loss of land and habitat and maybe if like rooftop solar in those cases are, are making some headway. Um, I don't know if you wanna to speak to that or some of the, the processes our developers are doing with um, at least trying to utilize the land in, in other ways like pollinators or planting native um, plants and such like that. Yeah, so uh, that is a, a loss of habitat or, or open space. I should say more than habitat. Loss of open space is a concern among many of us in the environmental community. Uh, it's a tricky situation because we have to weigh the pros and cons of everything. And we know that we need to switch off of fossil fuels as quickly as possible. We need to get rid of uh, the internal combustion engine as quickly as possible, but we want to protect as much open space as we can. So, uh, uh, we work with companies that are doing pollinator friendly solar sites so that at least uh, it's not impacting pollinators. Uh, there's also some renewed, uh, not, I shouldn't say renewed, there's new interest in something called uh, agrovoltaics, which is where you can still do some farming and, and growing some crops under the solar arrays as well. Uh, certainly the most preferred sites for us are brownfields or rooftops, or of course, parking lots if they were available. Great. Um, and someone noted here, Maryland pays very little for SRECs compared to DC. Do you only work with solar farms or would you consider allowing individuals who generate excess power to sell that power to us instead of selling the SRECs? Uh, I wish we could work with individuals to allow them to sell their extra power to us, but it's just, it's, it's not really feasible at this time, unfortunately. Okay, gotcha. And here's another one. Could you briefly walk us through how you would convince a homeowner to be your customer when that homeowner might have other offers on how to get clean, quote unquote, clean energy elsewhere? Oh, okay. Uh, well, I haven't done the sales in a while, but um, I'll say this. It's a, it's a complete no-brainer. And every time I explain it to people, they're like, why isn't everybody doing this? And the biggest hurdle to overcome is that trust because it sounds too good to be true. So here's what the offer is. The offer is that you sign up with Neighborhood Sun and you get anywhere from a 10 to 25% generally uh, discount. So what that means is that, that you're getting a share of power from a solar farm in your area. Every month when that solar farm produces power, the utility is putting credits on your electric bill just the same as if you had a rooftop system. Those credits bring your electric bill down to almost nothing. We then charge you for your solar share at that discount 
that I just mentioned from 10 to 25%. So let's have an example. What if it's a 10% discount? Let's say in a month, your electric bill is $100 and you got your solar share produced enough credits to equal $90. So now your utility bill is $10. Um, so that's a $90 savings. We then charge you for those $90, but we're going to charge you at 90% of the value. That's your 10% credit. So at 90% of the value is $81. So we would charge you 81. So you save $9 on a hundred dollar bill. You save $9. It's there's no equipment to install. There's no change to anything at your house or apartment or small business. Uh, it's just you're saving money every month and you're helping to clean up your local, not only are you helping to fight climate change, but you're helping to clean up your local air quality as well. Great. That's um, my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> got it down. Um, all righty. So we are projecting rapid growth, right? So how are we planning to achieve some of that growth? Well, the main driver of our growth is our Sun Engine platform. And uh, the, the growth I talked about to getting to 300 megawatts is actually already in our, sorry to use that word, pipeline. Uh, it's, it's already uh, at a stage where we have either term sheets or very close to contract. So we are at about 165 megawatts that we manage now. We have an exclusive contract with one solar asset owner who uh, brings us every single project that they have every year. So that, that is going to account for um, dozens of new megawatts every single year. It could be up to 75 megawatts or more. Uh, then we also have uh, uh, other projects that we're, we're about to start working on that uh, are in Maryland, uh, some of them are in uh, Massachusetts, and then others are in New York and, and um, other states as well. So with all that, that's just what we have immediately in front of us. That gets us to the 300 megawatts we're talking about, which uh, puts us well on the pace to hit those revenue numbers we're talking about. And all of that is driven by our Sun Engine platform, as well as our ability to acquire customers and our our brand ability to manage customers with, with um, uh, to keep customers happy and to um, provide consistently good service. Great. Um, going back to some of the consumers using their community solar energy from the solar farms, um, if we have a project that's generating a certain you know amount of kilowatt hours and we have X number of customers trying to sign on. Um, how do we make sure that there aren't too many customers on that solar farm? And can they purchase the rest of their power from their utility at the standard rate? Or how else do we limit the number of customers on a given solar farm? So we, um, we, we are able to adjust the sizes of, of customers. So if we get to a point where a solar farm uh, has, is filled up, uh, we can um, uh, adjust the sizes a little bit if we want to bring a few more people on, or we create a wait list uh, so that people can get on as soon as others move. I mean, we do have some attrition, so people do move and they, they cancel their subscriptions when they move, typically. Uh, so we always have openings for new projects. But I guess the real answer is that we, we are able to balance our full portfolio. We don't just have one or two projects now. We've got, as I said, well over 70 projects. So we're able to ensure that people always have a, a project to get to uh, most of the time. Uh, it's not a huge issue for us. Nice. All right. How and is the solar energy power affected by inflation? Um, you know, I think like everything in this, I, I think like everything, it is affected by inflation. Uh, but that's the beauty of our guaranteed discount. We're not saying that the, we're not selling you a product at a specific price. That's often dangerous. Uh, what we're saying is that no matter what 
the price is, you will always get, let's say, a 10% discount or 25% discount. So it, to put it in the most simple aspect, for every $1 of a credit you get from the utility, you pay us 90 cents. And that has no real, um, it's not impacted at all about whether prices go up or down. You are always getting that, that discount. I suppose if you wanted to be like super granular about it, you would say your 10% is discount has more dollars in it if, if there's uh, inflation on power prices. But, um, you know, I don't think that's super relevant. All right, here's one about LMI communities. Um, how will we ensure energy savings for low and moderate income communities going forward? In the sense that we're trying to create stronger communities that can resist increases, how do we go about doing that? So we advocate for the most possible inclusion of low and moderate income uh, rate payers in any community solar program. I recently participated on a panel in New Jersey, talking to state regulators there, trying to get them to open up the program for more uh, LMI participation. So this is uh, uh, at the heart of what we do in every state where we operate. We are trying to increase participation of low and moderate income communities. Um, we also have created the Neighbor Benefit Fund where we donate 1% of our revenue uh, is set aside for people who need uh, help in paying their electric bills, even with the savings that we're offering them. So that's another way to provide a safety net and financial support for people. Uh, then the part about, uh, the, and the discount is guaranteed. So that, I mean, it, we, it, it's in the contract, it's a guaranteed discount. And for low and moderate income uh, customers of ours, the discount is typically 25 or 30%. So it's a much higher discount than for the market rate customers. And then the part about how do we uh, help keep these communities strong and or help them strengthen. Um, that is, I, I love that question because that's a big piece of what we want to do. We, I have to say we've done some and there's much more we can do. Uh, when we go into a community, we want to work with people who are from that community. We want to work with institutions and civic groups that serve that community. Uh, we, we look to do educational programming above and beyond just talking about community solar. If, if, a, if a community was interested in talking about energy efficiency or other ways to protect that community, we would be thrilled to kind of put that together. Uh, and then we also want to start getting people a little more aware of, of uh, legislation and political issues that are happening that impact that community. So if uh, utilities are trying to increase rates uh, or if there's a power plant that's gonna be built at, at a community, you know, if we have enough uh, um, uh, people that are, that are part of our network, we can help to resist those, those, uh, those attacks on the community. Great, and one more question I see here is, do you allow businesses to sign up or is it only for residential customers? Uh, businesses can sign up. Uh, it depends on, uh, not every project allows businesses. Some of them are residential only. Uh, so it's, uh, but there are businesses that sign up, uh, especially in the, I don't know where the questioner is from, but in, um, and the projects we're currently working on in Maryland and uh, New York, uh, they do um, allow businesses to sign up. But you should definitely just check in with us. You can either email me or you can email hello at neighborhoodsun.solar. All right, and that looks like it for all of the questions, actually. So, yeah. Great. And, um, Thank you, everybody. I think we hit most of the questions that I typically get. Uh, so um, I want to leave you with the, uh, the reminder that uh, you can go to wefunder.com slash neighborhood sun to find out a lot more about the investment opportunity. 
and uh, to watch a little video, a cool video we did. If you invest in the next 48 hours, we will uh, send you a $50 his best gift card to give to uh, a charity of your choice. And um, we really appreciate anybody who comes on this journey with us for a cleaner, greener future, to make it more equitable, to make it accessible to everybody, to scale and grow quickly because the climate cannot wait and to help empower communities as best we can. The investments we've received to date have done all of this and have contributed a great deal to our success. So I'm extremely grateful for those. And for those who are considering investment, uh, I appreciate you giving us a chance and perhaps participating in this journey with us in the future. So thank you, everybody.